Matthew chapter 9, we'll begin in verse 18. It says, While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood twelve years came behind him, touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus uh, turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good cheer, thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. And when Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the minstrels and the people making noise, he said unto them, Give place, uh, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when the people were put forth, he went and took her by the hand, and the maid arose, and the fame thereof went abroad into all the land. We're going to back up to verse 18. Uh, the ruler that he is uh, speaking of, I'll just remind you, uh, was, uh, would have been the ruler of the local synagogue there in Capernaum. And so he was, the, he was kind of the head religious man of that community. Uh, and uh, his name, based on what we learn from uh, the parallel passages in, in, in Mark and, and in the book of Luke, his name was Jairus, okay, or Jairus, if you will. Uh, and by calling upon the Lord Jesus Christ to heal his daughter, he's showing a tremendous amount of, uh, of faith and humility. Faith in the sense that he believes Jesus is able uh, to, 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 to do this. Humility in the sense that he was a very religious man. He was the ruler of the synagogue, the local synagogue. And um, he, he was a religious man that ran with religious crowd. And uh, the ones who were supposed to have the spiritual answers, the ones that were supposed to be able to fix the problems. And yet, in this case, neither they, uh, his religious friends, or himself had the answer to his daughter's death. And so he did uh, 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 what was necessary. His daughter was dead. Uh, he's not worried about saving face with his friends. At that point, I promise you, when you've lost a loved one, you're not concerned about what your buddies are thinking. And uh, he just wants his daughter back. So he did what he should have done, and he asked Jesus to come and touch her. So Jesus and his disciples set out after the man, and while they were on their way, they didn't get very far, and another need arose. And we'll go ahead and read verse 20 again. It said, And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood twelve years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. Uh, this woman, much like Jairus, uh, knew who to turn to. Uh, she also had faith. She also had, uh, in spite of the fact that she, this woman was probably an outcast, okay, uh, based on her situation. In spite of being an outcast, in spite of being looked down upon, she was willing to press through the crowd enough so to get to Jesus and just touch the hem of his garment, okay? For 12 years, uh, she had dealt with this persistent hemorrhaging, if you will, an issue of blood. That's exactly what it is, a hemorrhaging, okay? Mark tells us uh, in his account of this, his parallel account of this particular text, that she had spent much money on doctors and uh, uh, had seen many doctors. Okay, so she's done everything she can in an attempt to find some kind of relief from what seems to be some sort of a, 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 a female re reproductive situation where she just uh, uh, has this continual hem hemorrhaging for the last uh, 12 years. Her condition, that condition of, of hemorrhaging blood like that would have made her um, ceremonially unclean according to the Old Testament law. Uh, she would not have been able to participate in anything at the local synagogue. And of course, if she traveled to J Jerusalem, she would not have been able to have anything to do with any of the festivities and the, 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 uh, the, the, the worship uh, things that took place at the temple. She would have been very limited on her social interaction with the people around her. Even the chairs that she would have sat in or any bed or cot that she might have laid in would have had to have been considered unclean for seven days, okay? Uh, any person who touched her or whom she touched would have also been considered unclean for seven days. So you can imagine the stigma that was uh, attached to such a condition as she was dealing with. Everyone would have tried to av avoid this lady, to steer clear of her. And, uh, and, and she would have 
been responsible to, uh, to, to, to keep her distance, even from her own family. She would have been very limited in how much direct contact she could have with her own family without making them ceremonially unclean as well, okay? So it, it was very much like something that we recently talked about, which was leprosy, okay? And it wasn't contagious like leprosy, but it was a similar constitu- uh, situation that she was looked at a lot like a leper would have been looked at. And uh, she would have been a very desperate woman uh, for some sort of cure. This was not new to her. This is 12 years she's been dealing with this. And, and I read about, this was interesting, uh, the Jewish rabbis who wrote the Talmud. If you're not familiar with the Talmud, I'm not greatly familiar with it, but it's thousands upon thousands of pages written by Jewish rabbis over the course of centuries adding to the Word of God. There are little rules and there are little traditions, okay? I've told you before how ridiculous some of them were. Well, within the Talmud, there were actually many uh, so-called remedies for this condition that uh, this lady uh, had. And I'll, I'll read them to you and you tell me if you think they'll help. Okay, one of them is this, and then a very outlandish. And it's likely... As a desperate woman, she may have tried some of these things. One was, you are to carry around the ashes of an ostrich egg in a linen bag during the summer and in a cotton bag during the winter. So who comes up with that, okay? A rabbi, I guess. Number two, you are to carry about a kernel of barley corn that had been found in the dung of a white female donkey. So you can imagine what she has to work with here. I mean, these are things that they literally wrote down as remedies for this. So all this silly type activity that she has uh, around her from the rabbis or whatever, you take that coupled with the humiliation of her condition being uh, alienated from those around her, being ostracized by many because of this hemorrhaging, she probably was at her wit's end. And But her troubles, as you know, as we've just read, were about to be over because verse 21 says, For she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. She had a confidence that if I can only get to this man, she'd seen enough from a distance to know that Jesus was somebody that could help her. And she said, If I can just get close enough to touch his clothing, uh, then I'll be made whole. And that's just such a childlike faith that this woman had and it was a faith that did not uh, was not in vain because verse 22 tells us it says but Jesus uh, 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 but Jesus turned about him and when he saw her he said daughter be of good cheer thy faith hath made thee whole and the woman was made whole from that hour now Luke's account of this particular uh, 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 story tells us that the hemorrhaging stopped the moment that she touched uh, the hem of his garment, okay? It also tells us a little bit more information about Jesus, what he did. It says that, that, that he sensed or felt the power of the virtue having left himself, and that was what resulted in him turning to the lady and, and replying what he replied. So all of this information compiled from these various gospel uh, texts uh, tell us that she touched him, uh, touched his clothing, which immediately healed her, And then Jesus, uh, detecting that, what had happened, he turned and told her, hey, it's your faith. It's your faith. You're believing in me is what brought this about. Your faith has made thee whole. That's what caused this this miracle. But but something that could be really easily overlooked uh, in this is the fact that Jesus, you think about this, in, in in front of all of everybody Jewish, Jewish leaders, everything, the Jewish ruler, uh, that uh, of the synagogue, the whole nine yards, he didn't give one hoot about the ceremonial uncleanness that would be uh, given to him if, if he were to touch this lady or if she was to touch him. He, he didn't care what it would look like in the eyes of the religious crowd around him. He simply was just about getting the job done. This lady needs him, and uh, he met those needs. And And I think this serves as a tremendous example to you and I uh, about uh, uh, being focused on the needs of people and the willingness to not be distracted, not be caught up in the uh, peripheral 
too much, so much so that we miss the personal needs of those around us. In fact, I preached on this just a couple of Sundays ago, if you'll remember, uh, uh, about uh, Jesus says when you, when you make a feast, uh, 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 call the poor and the maimed and the, and the lame and the blind. And, and when he says call there, that's intentional. In other words, you go get them and bring them in. And so it gives us a picture of the kind of ministry that, that Jesus would have us uh, be involved with. It's not just a passive, well, if I run into somebody in need, I'll, I'll be there. Or if I so happen upon somebody in need, but rather a active, proactive situation of making sure that you look for the needs and, and maybe go out and seek the needs and the opportunities. And, and uh, if we are... Uh, if we want to be doing the ministry that Jesus did in His kind of ministry, then we have to be willing to get dirty. Amen. We have to be willing uh, to, to, to it, it, in fact, I'll go as far as to say that if, if we don't, it, it's not a complete ministry, let's put it this way, if it does not involve some kind of, 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 of needs, okay, uh, whether it be outcast, underdogs, forgotten people, whatever, uh, we, we tend to uh, kid ourselves into thinking that we're serving Jesus just because we're sitting in a church among everything neat and orderly and well packaged. And the truth is that's fine, okay? I like neat too, but that's not real ministry. It's not a complete ministry. It's not a complete ministry until, as Jesus said, you call the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. You make sure that needs are being met and uh, that's a part of of the goal of, of, of what you're trying to accomplish. And so that's not to say that there's not room for ministry in all walks of life, amongst all classes. Uh, everybody needs ministry, okay? But uh, we don't get to choose one or the other. We should be open to all those ministries at all times. We might like to be comfortable in our ministries, but uh, comfortable is not what meets the needs of those that, that, that are going to cause us to get their hands dirty, okay? And so I think there's just so much great... Um, um, example in what Jesus is doing here. We've seen so much as you as you look down through this particular text alone, uh, how Jesus is uh, ministering to these people. He took time out. He got a crowd around him. He's covered up with people. But yet when that ruler uh, of, of the synagogue um, uh, asked for him to come bring his daughter back to life, he responded. He's willing to leave the masses and go deal with a one little individual little girl. And the fact that he ministered to the ruler equally as he ministered to the unclean, unclean lady, un ceremonially unclean lady, in the same way shows that there's no divine partiality. He, he, didn't, he didn't make a, any kind of distinction from the religious guy over here or the, the outcast lady over here. He was, he was busy. He was a busy man. He's, as I said last week, we got a busy Savior, okay? He had people all around him, but yet uh, he was willing to take time out for both of these cases. The, 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 the one that, uh, that had his business together and then the one that uh, had, had the issue of blood. And uh, you think about this. I thought I tried to put myself in his shoes and I already failed the test, I promise you. When you're covered up with things to do, you've got so much going on, and uh, in his case, he's surrounded by people. He's already on his way to go take care of this, this guy's daughter who's, who's, who lay dead at home. That's where he's, he's on the way, he and his disciples. Then he gets stopped. This lady touches his garment. He turns around and deals with all of that going on. And yet his demeanor towards this lady was nothing but kindness and encouragement. You sense no frustration. You sense no uh, aggravation whatsoever. And, and, of course, that needs to be the case for all of us. I, I just wonder how well we would do. Uh, I, I know I would fail so often under those circumstances. We get impatient. We get short with people, uh, usually the people closest to us, uh, when with a little bit of pressure. And here he is. He's got the pressures of the whole world upon him, and he sets a great example uh, for us. And so there's so much that can be learned simply by watching uh, Jesus minister from day to day. When you read the Gospels, it's just if you'll pay close attention to the details of Jesus' day-to-day ministry, it will give us such examples 
of how we are to conduct ourselves in our day-to-day -day, uh, ministries as well. Real quickly, let's do a little uh, uh, quiz. Uh, we've got our, I dropped this just a moment ago. I might not get back up, folks. <laughs> okay. If you got a little bookmark here, if you didn't get one, I'll be glad to give you one after, after we dismiss from here. But remember the Old Testament. How many books are in the Old Testament? Huh? 39. All right. And that leaves how many in the New Testament? 27. For a total of 67, right? 66. Some of you say, yeah, that's right. All right, we got five categories of the Old Testament, okay? And Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Solomon fall under what category? Poetry, okay? Then you have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel fall under what category? Major prophets. The reason they're major prophets is simply because the books are so much longer. More, more verses, more chapters, more words. That's the only thing that distinguishes them from the other group of prophets, which is the minor prophets. And then, of course, the first five books of the Bible are called the law. All right? The rest of the books, Joshua all the way through Esther, those are history. So let's bounce over to the New Testament. It falls into five categories. The first category, of course, is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We all know them as the Gospels. Okay, that's one category. Then we have the early church, uh, which is, just takes in uh, early church history is what I've always referred to it as. It takes in one book, the book of Acts. We've already studied that. Uh, just uh, took us about three years to get through that. We studied that. Now, uh, it, it, it jumps towards the end of the book on this, this little deal here. And the, the, the book that falls under the category of prophecy is Revelation, okay? And then there are two more categories. Real quick, uh, can somebody tell me what an epistle is? It's a letter. I thought it was the apostles' wives, <laughs> but it wasn't. It was a, it, it's a letter. So, uh, yes. And so when we're dealing with the general... <laughs> yeah, that was good, wasn't it, Aaron? It was a, it was timing. It's all in timing, Aaron. Uh, anyway, they're just, they're, the general epistles or general letters, okay, are Hebrews, James, First and Second Peter, First, Second, Third John, and Jude, and then of course the uh, what the theologians would call the Pauline epistles or the letters of Paul are all of these others. I won't try to mention each one of them, okay, and just simply meaning that Paul. The Apostle Paul wrote all of those epistles or those letters, okay? And with that being said, let's go ahead and uh, stand and be dismissed. You passed. First day of class and you did so good.